to be in control is to have power over something or have the right to direct the course of action that's going to be taken. And we often want control for ourselves and we don't like the thought of not being in control. Right? It scares us and intimidates us and different things. And so we want that control for ourselves. Well, God has given us free will, so we all get to decide for ourselves. The challenge we face is to give God control of our lives. Although this can be difficult, God promises that it will be rewarding. And I want you to think about, as we consider the idea of giving God control, I want you to think about the idea of clay in a potter's hand. Right? It is entirely up to the potter how to form that lump of clay. And I want you to see this in the scriptures, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, verses 3 through 6. Jeremiah says, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working away at the wheel. But the jar that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand, so he made it into another jar as it seemed right for him to do. The word of the Lord came to me, House of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats his clay? This is the Lord's declaration, just like clay in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, house of Israel. God wants to make us into something that is useful in his service, and he wants to use your talents and your abilities and your opportunities, etc., for his glory. So you need to present your life entirely to God so that he can mold you into whatever he desires and use you however he can in his service. You know, it's not up to the clay to tell the potter what to make it into. Instead, it is entirely up to the potter of how he wants to mold the clay. Giving God control of your life is at the heart of the gospel's message. You must fully surrender your life in every area. We're talking about um, your heart and your words and your conduct and your habits and your relationships and your emotions and your decisions and your religious practices and everything that we present our lives to God to let him control and mold us into what he wants. And there's no area in which we can, uh, that we keep for ourselves and we limit how God can work in our lives. The purpose of this lesson is to learn why you should give God control, what it means to give God control, and then how you can accomplish this great task. First, let's think about why give God control. And I want to begin thinking about that by putting into focus who God is, right? The, air, the question of why is so fundamental and one of the most important things that we need to answer in our lives about whole kinds of, all kinds of different things. But we have to answer, why should I give God control? You know, it, it is difficult, as I mentioned, to give control over your life over to anyone, you know, as, as you think about yourself, even though you recognize that you've got flaws and maybe even deep flaws, at least at the end of the day, you know, and I know, that we've got our own best interest at heart. But I want you to recognize there's a major difference between turning over the potter's wheel of your life over to an inexperienced potter there's a difference between doing that and turning it over to a master potter. When you're turning your life over to God, you are not turning it over to someone who is inexperienced or has no understanding about life or who has no concern for your well-being. In fact, those things would describe you and they would describe me better than it describes God. And so we need to appreciate that. So when you think about who God is, right, God is the almighty creator. Read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 to see that God was responsible for bringing everything into existence. And he's the one who's responsible for giving you life and for giving me life. In Acts chapter 17, verse 28, it tells us that it's in him, in God, we live and move and have our life. 
being. Next, we know that God possesses perfect knowledge. God is the one who wrote the book, so to speak, on life. He's not someone who's trying to figure it out and, um, as he goes along. He knows perfectly what it takes to be successful at life, and there is no comparison between God's knowledge and your knowledge. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then you need to recognize that God cares about you. And God cares about you more than anybody has ever cared about you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 tells us to cast all our cares on him, that is on God, because he cares about you. Think about it. God cares about you so much that he gave you life. God cares about you so much he created you as a spiritual being in his image. God cares about you enough that he's given you every good thing that you have in your life. And God cares about you so much that he gave his only son to die on the cross for you so that you can be saved from your sins. So we, can, we should give God control because of who he is. And we, we can trust in him as we yield our lives over to his control. But next, we should give God control because of our own insufficiencies. So as we consider giving God control of our lives, we've got to contrast who God is with, on the other hand, who we are and our limitations and insufficiencies. Forgiving will only give God control if we recognize that He is better suited and better qualified to control our lives than we are. So we need to recognize we are incapable of directing our own steps. The Bible teaches that you are not capable of knowing what is in your best interest by yourself. Jeremiah 10 in verse 23 says, I know, Lord, that a person's way of life is not his own. No one who walks determines his own steps. Even those things that you often think you should be doing will lead you down paths that will not please God and will result in consequences. Proverbs 14 and in verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. So I, I may think that I'm doing all the right things, but yet reali not realize that, that in trying to hold that control for myself, that I will take myself down a path that leads me to death. And I am a sinner who is des deserving of death. We have all tried to direct our own steps in our lives. And, we, and to maintain control and do what we think that we ought to do and that we want to do and so forth. And the consequence of that is summarized by Romans 3 and verse 23, saying, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, Maintaining that control over my life has resulted in committing sin. You have no doubt been tempted to please yourself and given into that temptation, disobeying God, James 1 verses 14 and 15. And what's, where did that get us is the question that we have to ask. Well, certainly there are probably many physical consequences to that, but Mainly, Romans 6, verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. So that's where I got myself. It's resulted in deserving spiritual death and eternity in the fires of hell. So I'm insufficient to control my life. But God has the words of eternal life. Since I have sinned and earned spiritual death, I cannot save myself from sin. Instead, I am dependent on the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Romans 6 verse 23, as we saw, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
Only Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life, as Peter recognized in John 6, verse 68, that can set us free from our sin, John 8, verse 32. So I need to give God control because of who he is, because of my own insufficiencies. Next, I need to give God control because I'm going to be judged. And you're going to be judged. As we recognize that God has full authority over all things and that we're insufficient to direct the, the course of our own paths in our lives, I need to recognize all this matters because I'm going to be judged and you're going to be judged by God one day. And that judgment will impact our eternity. God has promised that we're going to stand before Jesus Christ one day and everything about our lives is we're going to have to answer for. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 gives us this picture saying, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may be repaid for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Everything you do, think, and say will be judged by him. The, the standard, the criteria that God will use to judge your life will be his words. So your life will be evaluated by what is written in the books that contain Jesus' words, the books of the New Testament. Revelation 20 and verse 12 gives the picture of the judgment day scene. And there, as everybody standing before the throne, there were books that were opened. Another book was opened, it says, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by what was written in the books, right? The, the books that contain the, the law of God in the New Testament, these are the books that we're going to be judged by, John 12, verse 48. And your eternity and my eternity will, will be revealed at this judgment based on whether Jesus judges you to have been uh, faithful in his service or unfaithful in his service, whether, whether you've lived um, to please him or not. To obey him or not, you will either be welcome to an eternal reward in heaven or you will be sentenced to eternity in torment in hell. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And then we need to recognize, you need to give God control because... Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for you. We have to step back as we realize where we got ourselves when we maintain control for ourselves, all the, the death that we deserved for our sin, as we talked about earlier. And thanks be to God that we're not doomed and, and hopelessly lost in our sins and doomed for everlasting punishment. Through Jesus, you have the opportunity to be forgiven of your sins just as I have. And through his sacrifice, because of this sacrifice, you should desire to live your life entirely for him, to give your life to him. You need to appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Again, God cares about you so much that he sent Jesus to make that sacrifice so that you can be saved and I can be saved and not experience the everlasting torment that you deserve or I deserve. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Jesus willingly left heaven where there is no pain and there is no evil and there is no suffering and there is no death. And he left heaven to come to this earth and to be mistreated and to be spat on and to be beaten severely and to be falsely accused and to be nailed to the cross and to die so that you and so that I can have the opportunity to be saved. Now, how should that love that's been demonstrated for us, how should that affect us? Well, let's look in 2 Corinthians again, this time in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, For the love of Christ compels us, 
since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. This passage teaches how Jesus' love that he has demonstrated for you must compel or control your life. The idea behind that phrase, as I understand it, is like you're, you're walking down a road that is so narrow. It's got walls on both sides. It's so narrow you can only go one direction. When you realize the love that God has shown for you through Jesus Christ, you can only live one direction if you really appreciate that love. You'll determine you can only go his way and not your own. You will give him control of your life. Titus chapter 2 shows that God's saving grace, as verse 11, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, what does that grace, that opportunity to be saved through Jesus, what does that do in our lives if we let it work? Well, it instructs us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts. So we stop doing some wicked things. And then it instructs us to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. So when we really understand the love of Jesus and the grace God has shown, it should create zeal for us to live for him and control our lives. So now that we've looked at why we should give God control, then let's think about what it means to give God control so we can get a good idea of it and not not make that mean whatever we want it to mean. You know, it's not enough just to give God control of certain areas of our lives when we feel like it. Jesus made it clear you cannot have more than one master. He says in Matthew 6 and verse 24, No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, many problems exist when you desire to give God control, some control, but not complete control. Although you may insist on having the final say or opportunity to veto God, serving God does not work like that. I want you to look at Luke chapter 9 with me. In verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone wants to follow after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So we we can't view that, all right, I'm going to give God control. I'm going to do most of what he says, but I've got veto power. I'm going to ultimately do what I want to do. That's not how this works. Deny self, follow Jesus, is what Jesus teaches. Follow him wherever he leads. We must present our lives to God as a living sacrifice. God doesn't accept for our life to be under the control and under the influence of this world. Instead, He wants control. He requires you sacrifice your life to Him entirely so He can use you in His service. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So, give God complete control of everything. Next, we need to recognize God will transform you by His Word, and He will lead you by His Word. You've got to recognize that God has not created you to be some kind of mindless robot who only ever listens to Him and can never disobey Him. 
In fact, the passages we've seen demonstrate that the, the, the um, choice belongs to you. God wants control, but the ultimate decision belongs to you. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ideas about how God is going to control your life, how he's going to lead you and guide you and take control. But God actually does that through the teachings of the scriptures, his word, his written word. You can see Ephesians 3, verses 3 through 6. When you read that God-inspired message of the Bible, you can understand the will of God. And reading this message will provide you with everything that you need to, to live in the way that pleases God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Studying God's Word teaches you exactly what He wants you to believe. It tells you exactly those areas of your life that, ex that He exposes as needing to be changed. And it teaches you everything you need to know about how to live to please God and how to serve Him. So that's what it means to give God control. He's going to give Give him complete control and transform you through his word, his written word in the pages of the Bible. Now, to for, further appreciate what it means to give God control, I want to think about some different expressions that we find throughout the pages of Scripture of failing to give God control. The first one is found in the book of Judges in chapter 21 and in verse 25 where it says, everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Now, during the period of the judges, the people of Israel would often disobey God and they would be punished. And this phrase is found at the, the end of this book, and it gives us some insight as to why they were experiencing that trouble, as they were all doing whatever seemed right to them whatever they wanted to do, rather than obeying God. Whenever we do that, we fail to give God control. The next phrase is found in the book of Nehemiah in chapter 9 and verse 30. The phrase says that they would not listen. They would not listen. The passage speaks of the Israelites confessing past sins of the nation who were, who were often disobedient to God. But yet, despite God's warnings as he would use the prophets and he would warn the people about what they were doing, they would not listen. There's a phrase of failing to give God control. And that, the next phrase I want to look at is found over in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 22. It says, He went away grieving because he had many possessions. Now that phrase is used concerning a rich young ruler who had come to see Jesus. And he wanted to know what he needed to do to have eternal life. And well, he had done a lot of good things. He had kept uh, the commandments as are identified, if you read earlier than the passages um, here in verses 21 and 22. And, and it shows us he was willing to do many things to obey God and to have eternal life, but he was not willing to give control over his wealth to Jesus. Because Jesus, when, he, when um, the man asked Jesus what he still lacked, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your belongings and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. The young man heard that and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. He would give God control of a lot, but not everything about his life. Next, we see in Acts chapter 24 and in verse 25, the phrase is, when I have an opportunity. Governor Felix, who makes this statement, became afraid when he heard the message of the gospel preached. However, rather than responding in obedience to the message 
he put it off. When I have an opportunity. So he didn't give God control of his life at that moment when he had the opportunity right then. He said he, he looked, he's going to look for a better time when he can give that uh, control of his life over to God. So the question is, you think through these few expressions we've looked at of failing to give God control. Do any of these expressions describe your attitude? Are you guilty of refusing to give God control in any of these ways? If not, God is not pleased with you. Next, let's flip that around then and think about some expressions of giving God control. I first want to direct your attention to Abraham in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 3, where the phrase is, Abraham got up early in the morning and set out to go to the place God had told him about. God tested Abraham by telling him to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar at the place that God had told him. But Abraham put so much trust in God and the promises that God had made that he did exactly what God commanded him, concluding God would make it work some way, even if that meant God raising Isaac from the dead, according to Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. The next phrase is found over in 2 Kings 22 and verse 2 where it says he did not turn to the right or the left. So in the midst of a history of wicked kings over God's people who rebelled against God's instructions, here's King Josiah who set his heart to obey God. And he went about when he learned God's commandments and he saw that they were not doing, uh, they had not been doing what God said. Well, now he began making the changes Uh, sweeping changes in the nation so they would be pleasing to God, not turning aside from what God wanted, either to the right or to the left. The next phrase is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, where it says, down in verse 11, and some of you used to be like this. You think about all these wicked things that are mentioned. And the city of Corinth was notorious for its immorality, especially its sexual immorality. But when the gospel came to the city of Corinth and was presented to these individuals who were involved in all these wicked things, verses six and nine, uh, six, uh, verses 9 and 10 teach us, well, they turned. They were willing to change their lives. You used to be like that, so you're not anymore. The gospel changed them. God changed them. So they would obey God. You used to be like this. And then I want to direct your attention to Galatians 2 and verse 20. The phrase, I have been crucified with Christ. When Paul learned the gospel... He was a man who was a persecutor of Christians, one who would deny Jesus. But the gospel came to him. He realized the truth, and he was transformed. So he went from a persecutor to a preacher who would then be persecuted often himself. And as he realized the great sacrifice that Jesus made for him, as this passage shows, that I have been crucified with Christ, And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When he realized the great sacrifice of Jesus, as we talked about earlier, he was willing to turn his entire life over to serving Jesus, not holding anything back. So as you reflect on these expressions of giving God control, do these expressions describe your attitude? Are you willing to give God full control over your life as these passages demonstrate? If so, you are on your way to pleasing God. Well, next, I want to, before we conclude our study, think about how to give God control. So we've looked at why give him control. We've looked at what it means to give God control. Now I want to look at 
how do we do that? To do that, I want to look at Proverbs chapter 3 to help guide us through this process. A very familiar passage to many, but one that is going to be particularly helpful in the context of how we give God control. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways, know Him, and He will make your paths straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So let's walk through this passage and let's look at some of the points that we can take from it about how to give God control. Number one, we must have complete trust in God. You will never give God full control over your life until you are absolutely convinced that you can fully trust God. So you must learn to trust Him with all your heart. We went through some reasons very quickly earlier about why give God control and why you should trust Him. But you can keep studying more to appreciate God. The more you trust God, the more control over your life you're going to give Him. If you want to trust in God with all your heart, you must remember who He is and trust that He is holy and He cannot lie, Titus 1 and verse 2. Therefore, trust that whatever God says is entirely true, John 17, verse 17. And then you must trust in his promises. Namely, you can know that if you are faithful to God through your life, God will reward you, and you will have eternal life in heaven. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Next, as we think about how to give God control, you've got to recognize God's authority. Recognize that whatever God says is right. Don't rely on your own um, standard of authority. Recognize his authority above your own thoughts and opinions and feelings. Now, authority involves two things. It involves power and right. Therefore, you've got to recognize that only God possesses power and right over all things. God has power over all things. God's clearly demonstrated this by creating everything. He's the only one who's capable of such a creation. And therefore, you need to recognize that you are entirely incapable of possessing the same kind of authority that he has. And the next, he has the right to control all things. He created all things. He's the maker and he's the designer. He knows how everything ought to function. He knows how he wants mankind to live to please him. With God possessing the right to control all things, guess what? That leaves you with no right, no authority that can supersede God's authority. Next, you must humble yourself. So in all your ways, you you know him. Don't be wise in your own eyes. When you put all your trust in God and you recognize his authority over all things, you'll recognize then the need to humble yourself, to know and fear him in all your ways. You've got to keep yourself in the proper perspective. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in yourself and think you are more important than you really are. So you can believe that you are better than you are, that you know more than you do, and that you're not dependent on anyone else. We can have that kind of high-minded perspective of ourselves, but we've got to keep ourselves in the right perspective. If we develop that kind of arrogant attitude We'll never give God control because we will be deceived about our own perceptions of our ability to control our lives. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 talks about clothing ourselves with humility toward one another. God resisting the proud gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
so that he may exalt you at the proper time. You must recognize God's ways as best. Rather than taking yourself too seriously, you must learn to take God seriously and learn that his way is always the best way. Therefore, rather than making decisions based on your own understanding and your own wisdom, you will make decisions based on a humble commitment to obey God in every area, that we will recognize his authority and then determine that whatever we do in word or in deed, we will do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is by his authority, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Colossians 3 verse 17. Finally, as we think about how to give God control, you must then submit to God. You must determine to submit yourself entirely to God's will. Just recognizing God's will as the right way is not enough to give God control. Instead, you must let Him make your paths straight by following wherever He leads. You must be a doer of God's Word. It's not enough to believe in God or believe that God's word is truth or learn God's word. Instead, you must be a doer of God's word that obeys his word. James 1 verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If you don't obey God's word, you may deceive yourself into thinking that God's in control of your life Maybe because you know what he wants you to do and you believe in him when you've actually kept control for yourself and you've just settled for a form of religion. You must yield to God's will by obeying his word. God expects you to submit to, to yield to him. James 4 verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Although there will be times when your desires are not the same as God's desires, you must yield to God regardless of what the issue is and what God instructs of you. So those are the four ways we give God control as we see in this passage. Have complete trust in God, recognize God's authority in everything, humble yourself, and submit to God. As we close this study... I want to ask, have you given control of your life to God? You must be obedient to God and allow Him to transform your life through His Word. If you will give God control over your life, He will transform you into what He wants you to be so that you will please Him and have eternal life in heaven.